Welcome to Crushing Comics, the show where I fall in love with my comic book collection all over again. I already have our book to unwrap today. I actually want to talk about my shirt here. Not specifically, but it says Dream Big. I bought the shirt at the 140 conference in New York uh, back in, I guess it would have had to be like 2010 or 11 where I used to go with my friend Nan once a year to see all these Twitter people talk about the power of social media. And this shirt was actually, even though the conference was in New York, the shirt was from Philadelphia, a group of young slam poetry kids from Philly, and, and their program director was there at 140 to talk about the influence it had had on their lives. And make me really think about, like, for participating in that kind of stuff when you're in high school, and, like, if it, regardless of if you wound up doing that thing professionally, like, I don't know if a lot of those kids are going to be professional beat poets. There's not a whole lot of professional poets out there. Um, both some. Like, how did it affect your life, right? I was never a big joy joiner, and I think that's because when I was in, like, grade school and middle school, the only thing there really was to join as a very small school was sports. And I just was not a sporty kid. And my mom tried to get me to join the, the Boy Scouts. And I remember I, like, I was like, I will just lock myself in the car if you bring me there. I wanted nothing to do with hanging out with other boys. Like, ooh. And, um, and so, you know, I, I was now in a much bigger school in middle school, and there were all these opportunities around, and I kind of just was shunning them out of the, the habit of shunning them. And it really, I really didn't get involved until, actually this is an amazing story, I didn't know I was going to go here. Uh, I went to this student assembly that everybody had to go to, and it was about um, sexual health and preventing sexual assault and abuse. And it had a series of people from the peer counseling team get up on stage. Peer counselors were like sex educators that were other students. Like they got trained by Planned Parenthood and the Red Cross to be able to do sex education because studies were showing that it was more uh, efficacious to have people your own age tell you about safe sex. And of course, this was a hot topic in the early 90s because AIDS was finally really being taken seriously and, and not just being seen as something that people who were, you know, adult homosexual men were potentially going to be the victim of. And so it gave a lot of kids agency to know about sexual health. And so I'm in this, um, I'm in this assembly and this guy gets up and gives this like life-changing monologue about abuse. It wasn't his abuse, it was written for him to give. And I just saw him on that stage and I said, I need to learn how to do that. I, I want to educate people about their agency and their sexual agency and health. And I want to be able to get up on stage and tell people something. And I did. I, I applied for and joined that peer counseling team. I became a peer sex educator. I joined theater and I became an actor. And I think it's how I met my wife. Um, it's all the guitars on the other side of this room. It changed my life. I, I don't know what my life would be if I didn't have that assembly. And do you know who that person was that was on stage? You actually might know who he is. Uh, I went to high school with him. He was in my ninth grade algebra class. It is Leslie Odom who won a Toady Award for playing Aaron Burr in Hamilton. So in addition to being beloved, I have chills just talking about this. In addition to being beloved now by millions of people who buy his records and have heard his, the Hamilton soundtrack, uh, Leslie Odom changed my life. He was just a good dude. And to bring it full circle, I have seen Leslie Odom do slam poetry in Philadelphia. There you go. Boom. Perfect, amazing story. Oh, ho, 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 ho. talk about things that are the start of things, right? Wow. This is X-Men. Volume 1, one of the most expensive and sought-after out-of-print Marvel omnibuses that exists today. Uh, let me just point something out, which I don't know if you're going to be able to see on the camera. This has a matte finish. You can tell, see how hard it is for me to get glare on this? You know how usually I'm always, like, doing the Watusi here, trying to make sure that you're not getting glare? This is a matte finish. Matte just means, like, it's um, not glossy, basically. And it's actually quite delightful. It takes scratches a little bit, like, you can kind of see maybe that little scratch, but it's really fun to hold and it doesn't like fingerprint up in the same way as gloss and you don't get all that shine off of it. It's the only omnibus dust jacket that Marvel did in this style ever. Like what the heck Marvel? They're so weird. Those crazy kids of Marvel. So this is the collection of Stan Lee's and Jack Kirby's original X-Men, although this also pushes into Roy Thomas taking over the cover. And this is a really interesting thing to open at this 
particular point in time because we've just had the two issues of Ed Pisker's Grand Design, X-Men Grand Design. Now, he had done Hip Hop Family Tree, which uh, I haven't even dug into, but it kind of just defines this whole evolving world of hip hop and how the artists are connected to each other. And he did, told Marvel, I want to do a project for you. And so he talked to their editorial and he's like, I love the X-Men. I want to do Hip Hop Family Tree for X-Men. So he put out two issues so far. The first issue is everything that comes before this, the X-Men prehistory. And then the second Second issue covers basically both this and the um, the volume two. Look at all the glare that comes off of this one, uh, omnibus, and does it in forty issues, which is just incredible. Um, and so, in a way, it brings up this question for me: of like, do you even still need to read this classic stuff? Right, people. This is not the best of all the classic runs. I love X-Men, but I don't recommend people read this from cover to cover the way that I do with Fantastic Four early stuff. Um, it's It's got certain issues that are great, right? I, I do recommend people read the four, first four or five issues of X-Men. I think it establishes a lot of ground. I think they should read the Sentinel stories. I think they should read the first issue of Juggernaut. But there's some duds in here. And, um, and I don't know that you need to read it straight through. And I don't know if what the X-Men franchise has recharacterized these stories as can even be gotten from reading the original versions. So, I don't know. I don't know if this still has value for a modern reader and lover of X-Men. It has great value for me. Look, I think that first issue of X-Men, with them fighting Magneto at, what is it, like Cape Canaveral with the missile launches, it is a, it is a marvelous, marvelous issue of comic books. The, the introduction of the team and the way that they're very, like, beholden and almost subservient to... Professor X was a very, very different vibe at Marvel. Of course, people would tell you that X-Men to a degree was ripped off of Doom Patrol, but it was very unique at the time, and the blowout with Magneto was unique, and um, it, it looked really great, too. So I think there's that. But then the following issues are really interesting. The second one has the Vanisher, eh. The third one, the Blob, which is kind of like where you start to getting the X-Men saying, like, there must be more mutants out there, right? Because this was the first introduction of mutants in, in the Marvel uh, universe, and them kind of finding that, like, not everybody wants to play along with them, right? But then, for me, the really interesting ones, at the beginning at least, are issue um, four, five, and six, because we get Magneto returning with the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, we get the introduction of Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, um, Toad, Mastermind, these are characters that are hugely important for Marvel. I would argue that issue four might be the most important issue of this entire run. And then you start to get their antagonism with Magneto, who who doesn't want to accomplish things totally dissimilar from what Professor Xavier wants to accomplish. And just the Magneto thread of this is very, very interesting if you just pull out the Magneto issues. And what Ed Pisker has done in Grand Design is he actually takes the phoenix as a thread, which is something that hadn't even been created at this point. But he, it's been retconned into this and into, like, Jean's life from when she first manifests her powers. And so Pisker kind of, like, tracks how the phoenix force was this bubbling understory across all of these stories. And he makes very, very minor tweaks to these stories to make it really seem like they're all running into each other. But they basically each get a page each. It's a 40-issue comic book. And um, and he basically covers both of these uh, omnibuses. And the stories at this time, a three-issue arc was, like, incredibly long. They're usually one and two issues long. So this has some other good stuff in it. It's got the first Juggernaut story. It's got the introduction of Banshee. And I want to say that's 20 issue 28. But um, the other thing that, to me, really is a great set of issues, and it's probably the ones that are the most significant to the long-term X-Men story in here, are the issues um, with the original Sentinels, which I think might be 16, 17, 18. And those issues were still Stanley. It was towards the end of his run. And it really crystallizes the hated and feared to the degree that the government is doing something about it. And that, to me, crystallizes this X-Men concept in a way that it's not just about racism or classism or kind of a regular kind of discrimination that we might all encounter in our lives day to day. It elevates it to a, a kind of discrimination that could result in genocide, right? That could result in wiping out a whole race of people. In this case, you know, mutants, Homer Superior. And I don't really think that that had been driven home previous to the Sentinels. And it was a big, scary concept for the Silver Age. And Lee 
you know, a lot of people have a lot of negative things to say about him for now, about how he stole concepts from Jack Kirby and said that they were his own. And you know what? He, he did negative stuff too. We can't just put these people on a pedestal and say that there was no negative and that it was all positive. But I think if you want to look at the actual text of the stories and whether or not it was the art generate, generated by his artists and he just put words to it or it was his concept, I can't tell you that. But what he was able to create in alchemy with those artists was something so significant, and that Sentinel story sets the stage for everything X-Men that comes after it. So should you just read Grand Design and skip out on this? I don't think you should go pay hundreds of dollars to this omnibus. We've all seen this omnibus get sold for $500, $600, $700. This, by the way, there's a lot of confusion about this. This is the mass market cover, the painted Alex Ross cover. The um, the Jack Kirby cover that matches the original X-Men 1 is the shorter run cover. There's a lot of confusion. You will find sources that disagree with me, but I'm telling you I've done the research and that is the answer. Um, should So no, I don't think you should shell out that major money. I also think that this omnibus is absolutely going to be reprinted in the next two years, especially because Marvel now has the film rights back to X-Men if the Fox deal goes through with Disney. So yeah, absolutely this is going to get reprinted. They know that it's valuable stuff. But what I would say to somebody right now today before a reprint is you should absolutely buy Grand Design Issue 2 digitally. It, it is an amazing Bible to this, even to me, as somebody who's literally written the guidebook in the form of a blog to this, it was eye-opening. And then I think you should go and you should read issues one through five, and then you should read possibly the Juggernaut issue just because it's the Juggernaut, but you should especially read uh, the Sentinel stuff. And that would be my recommendation. So this, uh, one of those great examples of something I never had the ability to read other than the first issue, which Marvel has reprinted very many times. And I ripped the cellophane open off of this when I got this book. It was one of my first omnibuses I got the day that it came out. Uh, and I was so excited to have it. And I'm still so excited. It's part of my collection. It's the genesis of my favorite franchise and what brought me to and back to comic books. So here is the very important, very official ceremonial shelving of X-Men Volume 1 by Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Roy Thomas, and Werner Roth. And uh, do we have a stock? We do. I left a clock board right here. Wow, we are, we might be at complete X-Men omnibus right now. I don't know that there's any missing from the shelf because they don't have the Onslaught omnibus. We, we might be there. So um, there are more books to unwrap, although possibly not any more X-Men books. I, don't, I can't think of if there are any more. So tune in to the great continuing mystery of what I'm going to continue to open and fall in love with from my wall of comic books. And I would remind you uh, to be inspired to dream big. Thank you so much for watching.